Today we're going to be talking about the course project, which is what most of the course grade is given for, and um, also like what the course is all about, right? So all these assignments are really just adding to our game engine over time so that we can make a decent game for the final project. So please, I, I have a bunch of wording here um, that we'll see, but please take the the final project as seriously as any final exam or anything like that. It really is the main thing that you're going to be graded for for the course. So here um, you can see that there's a little link right here and that's going to take you to this GitHub, GitHub repo. And uh, this GitHub repo, uh, I'll zoom in on it in a second so you can actually read stuff with me. Um, but this GitHub repo is essentially where all of the project information is. So, uh, as you can imagine, we're probably going to be using GitHub for uh, the project. And what I've done is I've set up um, this GitHub template repo, which makes it extremely easy to just copy this repo for your own purposes. So, if you've never used a template repo before, uh, it's just like any other GitHub repo. Um, but, over here, the most important part is that it has this button called Use This Template. And so, what you're going to do is there's a D2L uh, Dropbox, and, or assignment box, whatever you want to call it. And once you uh, get your group of up to four people together, then what you're going to do is one person from that group is going to submit the, the URL for the repo uh, to D2L. And you're going to add me and you're going to add TA, the TA as collaborators on that repo so we can see your stuff. And that's all you ever have to worry about for the rest of the course in terms of submitting your project. Because on the due date of the project, we're just going to check your repo. That's it. And so we'll pull it, we'll be able to run it, it'll be no problem, no worrying about file sizes on D2L or late submissions or any of that. Um, well, I guess you do have to worry about late submissions. Don't be late, of course. But what I mean is, when the, when the project is due, we just look at the repo, we clone it, and we run what you have there. Um, also, <clears throat> the GitHub makes it um, kind of nice for being able to track, uh, not that we're spying on the GitHubs, trust me, I have better things to do than to uh, like monitor your GitHub activity, but if you do come to me at the very last minute and say something like, hey, we've been working like dogs nonstop on this project for the last month and we weren't, be able, you know, we weren't able to get it done on time, if there's zero commits in the GitHub, well, that's, you know, bring the receipts for all the work that you did. Right? So, it's just a little bit of, um, of uh, accountability, I guess, as well. And if people are saying, oh, this person never contributed anything, that person never contributed anything, it's just a nice way to make sure that everyone's sort of on the same page. Now, having said that, I do realize that sometimes groups won't necessarily be like all four people committing to the same repo. Sometimes you send the code to one person and they upload it. But just make sure you're keeping track of sort of who does what. So if there are any disputes or whatever, we can, uh, we can work it out at the end. So this template repo, all you have to do is click this button up here. And then you click Create New Repository. And then you are brought to this page. And essentially, you just give it a repository name. That'll be like comp4300-project or something like that. And then down here, the most important part is you click private, okay? So whoever in the group, just one person will technically own this repo. It doesn't matter to me who owns it. Just make sure that you only submit the URL once so we don't have a bunch of copies of that. And then as soon as you click create repository, it will clone this entire repository or it'll copy it as a new repository on your GitHub. It's not technically a fork or anything like that. It just takes all the content and now you have that repository. And the good thing about this repository, uh, now that I've done that, I think I can zoom in. And when you zoom in, um, oops, I think this about page goes away at some point. There you go. So when you zoom in enough, um, it goes away. So there are four folders in this uh, GitHub uh, repository by default, and they are all conveniently named with the due date of that thing. Okay, so the first thing here you see 2024-10-31 proposal. 12-03 uh, demo, 12-15 final project, and then project specification. So the proposal, um, actually let me go down here and uh, I'll, I'll do one thing before I get to all of these folders. But essentially everything that you do is going to be put into these folders. So the project proposal um, is just going to be edited right there in that folder. 
the demo, you are going to submit an early working version of your um, project with the level editor working and hopefully some other features. Um, then you're going to put the final version of the code in here and you essentially you won't put anything uh, into the project specification. But down here in the readme, uh, here are the instructions. So the instructions for your final project are to click the use this template green button in the top right of the repo, then create a new private repository as I just said, and then you're going to add um, these two users as collaborators on the project. Trust me, we're not going to make any changes to your project, it's just so that we can see it because it's a private repository. So this is me, and this is the TA. So here, here's how you do that, settings, manage access, um, and we'll get email notifications when that happens as well. And then submit your URL, uh, your new repo URL, uh, to this uh, assignment Dropbox, and then we'll have it there. Then um, you can click the pencil icon, and by the pencil icon I mean this edit file icon up here, um, to edit straight from the GitHub website. So for the proposal, and for the repo itself, this main readme file, you can just edit them straight on the GitHub website. Um, so you're going to edit your readme.md file, which is what displays all of this to include your group info, and remove this instruction section. So what you're going to do is, here you have up to four group members. You are just going to list all the group members right there, so I know who's in the group. And then as you complete some things, the project demo, you're going to put the YouTube URL for that here. You're going to put the trailer URL here. Um, and you're going to put the uh, presentation here. Okay, so you're going to have three YouTube videos that you make. It's just like gameplay with some narration to explain what you've done. And then you put those right there, so I don't have to like... if. It, the first time I did this, people were submitting them in completely different places, and I just want them all in the one place there. And then here, if there is any instructions to run your project, like even if it's just open up the solution file and click run, um, make sure that you just put um, whatever instructions you need to run your project right here. So the way that you'll do that is you'll just click this button, and then uh, this is a bit small, so let me just uh, zoom out. And so this will all be here. This is just the GitHub markdown. And you can just come here, very first thing that you do, uh, remove these instructions because I don't need those anymore. Then you come down, oh, David Churchill, here's my student number, and you know I'm in the group with these other three people. Okay, so that's the very first thing that you do, and that shouldn't be very difficult. And then uh, somewhere, I think if you make changes, then this, let me see, yeah, so that becomes available, then you just commit the changes, you don't need to use anything. Um, so leave that page. So that's, that's the setup for the project, okay? That's, it's pretty easy. All the instructions are here, and we're going to go over all the instructions now. Um, I'm going to read every single one of them. It'll probably take the whole hour just to read it all, but I want to make sure that A, I didn't make any mistakes, and B, there are no excuses to, oh, I didn't know that we had to do that, or I wasn't sure what that specific thing meant. Okay. Um, any questions at any time, just put up your hand. This is a pretty informal lecture, so um, be sure to ask questions if you want. Okay, so the very first thing is the proposal. So if I click on proposal here, um, so every one of these folders is going to have a readme.md file, and the readme.md file is just the thing that ends up showing up down here. Okay, so if you edit that file, or if you click edit right here, that is what shows up when you do this. So what you do is you just edit this file to contain your project proposal. So you're not writing it in Word, you're not writing it in a Google Doc and submitting that, you're not like uploading a text file, you're just putting your proposal straight into the GitHub readme file. Couldn't be easier. And all you have to do is click the edit button here and then edit it and just click commit and it's already done for you, okay? So edit this file to contain your project proposal. Use proper Markdown formatting. So Markdown, you can just Google it, or there's a tutorial on GitHub for how to use their Markdown. You can just make things like titles, or make things bold, or include links, or screenshots, or whatever, right? If you do uh, want to include some diagrams or whatever, like, oh, hey, here's what we're proposing, here's a little sketch of that, not that that's necessarily required, but you can just put that, fol that file inside the proposal folder in GitHub, and then you can display it there in the readme file if you want to, okay? So your proposal will be reviewed to determine whether or not it is enough work or too much work for the scope of the, co of the course. 
It should describe the following information and be approximately two to three pages in length. I mean two to three pages in terms of scrolling in the website. Uh, you know, whatever font size that happens to be. So whatever your game name might be, um, the genre of the game, and I'll get into that when I get into the project specification, like what type of game you can make, the overall theme, any, um, the, the main gameplay style, <clears throat> any description of the game that you come up with. Now keep in mind that I do understand that um, this may change. So the thing that you propose is not necessarily the exact thing that you're going to build. But what you're going to do when you submit the final project is you're going to have a little section that says, here's what we proposed and here's what's different from that um, in our actual game. Okay, so there may be a couple of differences, but um, that's fine. I understand that that happens. Uh, give a few examples of gameplay scenarios involving each of the game uh, mechanics that you describe, and a list of extra features of the game which have not been completed in assignments. So this will all make a bit more sense once I go over the uh, project specification folder, because that has like the entire list of everything that I want you to do for the project. But just again, um, any additional files which you probably won't have would go into this proposal folder, and then you just have to click this edit button and edit the proposal there. So get together with your group, write up a proposal for, the, for a game. Um, I just recommend going out and looking at some of the example games that I've given in, um, in the project specification sheet. If you've played them before or if you haven't, just check them out, watch a YouTube trailer, and then say, okay, I want our game to be like this, we want our game to be like that. Any questions at all about the proposal? I think that's probably the, the easiest part to understand. Okay. Um, there is a project demo folder and a final project folder. So let's go to the demo folder and see what that says. So again, um, what you'll do, your final project is probably going to consist of a starting point of maybe like assignment three or assignment four. Probably assignment four because there are just more features in assignment four. So when you get ready to start the project, you're going to take your completed assignment four and basically just put it on GitHub, right? And then you'll be working from that assignment four. So I want the file structure to be exactly the same as the assignments. Don't make any drastic changes. Just take that and put it in and it should all work. And you just see like, so if you take your assignment folder in here, you'd have the bin folder, the source folder, the Visual Studio folder, etc. inside this folder. So what you can do is when the demo is due, copy and paste the checklist from the project specification into this section to indicate which features have been completed. And again, I'll get to the project specification thing. But what is the demo? Well, the, for the project initial demo, you must record a narrated three to five minute video showing your project, project, project progress so far. The following features must be present in the demo. So you can do as much as you want for the demo. And if you want to be sort of, you know, on track to finish, you should have probably the majority of your game finished by the demo time. Because the demo is due on the 3rd of December, and then the final project is due less than two weeks later, right? So by the time the demo comes around, like about two thirds of your time for the project has passed. So make sure that you say, okay, if two thirds of the time hasn't passed, maybe we need to catch up a bit, right? And depending on how many exams you might have, you know, you can say, okay, well, I'm gonna, we're gonna leave most of our work for the exam period, or I have five exams, I wanna do most of the work beforehand. That's what you have to talk about with your group members. So make sure that you're budgeting your time accordingly. But here's what has to be done, okay? A functional, functioning level editor using IM GUI. It doesn't have to be the exact final version that you have in, you, you have uh, that you're going to submit for your final project, but it must be able to create, load, and save levels, edit entities, drag them on, delete them, whatever. You must be able to create levels in this version of the project. Trust me, if you've gone to the demo, like that, that due date of the demo, and you don't have your level editor yet, then that's going to be an issue. You, that's probably one of the more complicated things that you're going to be doing for the project, so make sure you get started on that. Also, I got a, a question on Discord about this. I think it was in the public channel, but it was like, can we make a level editor for the level that we have to create in assignment three? Sure, and you can get bonus marks for that in assignment three, and also 
have most of your level editor done for the final project, right? So if you're saying to yourself, hey, um, I've got a bit more time right now than I will have toward the end of the year, then maybe just do the level editor, ed level editor for assignment three, get your 100% with your bonus marks for assignment three. It's also worth the most of any assignment. And so you're like double dipping. Rather than wait until later, and just get those marks for the project, why not do it for one of your assignment three or assignment four, and then also have it done for the final project. Um, I want most of the gameplay mechanics to be implemented. You don't have to have all of them done. I'm, I'm well aware that you've still got almost two weeks left, so not everything has to be done. <clears throat> but the demo is basically going to be given full marks, or maybe close to full marks, or very, very low marks. It's, just, it's essentially how much work have you put into the project so far. So do they have this done? Yes, okay, 95 or 100% on the demo. If they don't, it's close to like 50% or less than that for the demo marks. The demo isn't worth a lot, but it certainly is worth enough that you should definitely have this done on time. The reason the demo exists is because no matter how much time that a professor or a teacher gives for an assignment or a project, if I gave you four months to work on this, you'd probably still start it in the final three weeks or two weeks, right? So this is like a midway milestone to keep you on track to just make sure that you have done something, right? And the level editor is a big part of that. So you're going to, once you complete that, record a few minutes of gameplay footage where you narrate the game mechanics that you want to be displayed. Um, don't waste any video time with like retrying things. I got one demo video once that was like six minutes long and three of the minutes was like trying to compile it and there was a compiler error and they were like debugging the compiler error, right? <laughs> don't, don't show me that. Just get it to a state where it's working and just walk me through some gameplay of the game. Um, pay more attention to any new mechanics you have implemented that are not implemented in the assignment. And remember, this is your video. I have no idea what's actually working or not. Don't lie to me, but if there's some bug, just don't show me the bug, right? Not that if there is one bug, you're gonna lose marks on the demo, but like, this is your, just sell it to me, right? Make sure that what you have submitted is showing the things that are implemented and working. And you know, sometimes when you just get something working for like the demo, but it's kind of broken, and if you, you know, if you jump on the pipe, you know it's gonna crash, don't jump on the pipe, right? Just, just show me that you've gotten a bunch of stuff working. It doesn't have to be the final version. I will probably not be looking at the demo code unless what you've shown me is horrendous, right? Or it's suspiciously overdone, like, hey, I've gotten the whole thing working by the demo time. Nobody has ever done that before, right? You're all students, you've all got a lot of stuff to do. Um, if, if anyone is like, oh, I've got this like polished AAA game that you're submitting, I'm probably gonna look at that code, right? To see who you paid to, to do that. Um, okay, so this folder should contain the following three directories. Uh, the bin folder, the source folder, and the Visual Studio folder. Um, even if you have done your project in Linux or on a Mac, please still include the Visual Studio folder with, an, with a solution file because the marker is going to be running and grading the projects on Windows, okay? So if you absolutely can't do that, come to me, we'll talk about it, but it'll be nice if we could just double click your solution file and hit run and everything would work, okay? So that's, um, that's what I would like to happen. So you have bin, this must contain a compiled executable. Um, any additional files that you need, so any assets that you've put in there, they should have the same structure as assignment three as assignment four. Don't include any Visual Studio output uh, debugging files. The source, that of course must contain all your source code and must contain your Visual Studio project files, delete all temporary output directories, um, et cetera. Like, like these folders contain up to hundreds of megabytes of these debugging symbols and stuff that are absolutely not necessary. Um, so that's the demo. Just get a bit done and submit it as the demo, right? That's, that's what I want here. Um, and in terms of not submitting these things here, if, there are, if you have not used Git before, 
well, you're probably going to want to, to get started on Git and GitHub because you're going to be using it in your job starting next year or something, you know, after you graduate. But this git ignore file, um, what I've done here is I have created a sample git ignore file for C++ projects where like, okay, the, the .d dependency files, the shared object files, so .obj would be Visual Studio object files, .o would be complete, would be uh, Linux and Mac object files. And if you want a directory, like that Visual Studio slash x64 directory to not be included, then you would have to type the name of that directory in here and then nothing would be included, right? So I've seen some people before, your GitHub repo, if you take away your assets, your whole entire repo should be less than a megabyte in size, probably, right? So if you look and you're checking out the repo and it's like 200 megs minus the assets, because maybe you have a bunch of sounds or a bunch of um, textures or something like that, but everything outside the bin directory is like hundreds and hundreds of megabytes, and you say, okay, there are some of these temporary output files that we're not ignoring properly, and you want to ignore those because they're not relevant to the project, and it's just making it so whenever you check in or out your code, it's like so much more data that you need to be um, checking in and out than is necessary. And so this git ignore file is exactly what it says. It will just ignore any of those files. Okay, um, the final project folder is the exact same thing as the demo folder. It's just that's where you put the final project. So I don't really need to explain that one. And then comes the big one, which is the project specification. So right now, um, this project specification folder, you don't need to add any files to this. But what I recommend is that I've implemented this as a sort of checklist of all the features. So as you implement new features, go to this checklist, click the little edit button, and put a little X in there, and you can mark off the feature as done. So that way, you can visually just look at this huge checklist of what we need to do for the project, and then, um, you know, oh, no one's done that yet, I'll do that. Or we've done all of this thing, so we don't need to worry about that. So let's just go through this and read it all. So the final project for Comp 4300 can be do done in groups of up to four people. And I highly recommend four people for the group. So I have designed this to be enough work for four people, right? So if you only go with two people, you're probably doing double the work. If you go with one person, you're probably doing four times the work that you should have to. And I know that yes, in a group of four people, maybe one person is a bit stronger programmer than one person, so it's not exactly split out. Yeah, I get that. But just keep in mind that I have designed this specifically for four people, right? Now, if it comes to it and there's a special case of like, okay, there's four N plus one students in the class where everyone is nicely formed into groups of four people and there's one person outlier and they're desperate, I'll add them to a group of their friends or whatever. Now I may add another feature for that group because they've got an extra 25% of people working on it, but don't worry, you won't be stuck um, with just being by yourself. But please do not delay on getting a group together for the project. I'm not saying you have to have it done today, but the project proposal is due in two weeks. Right? So even if you just wait until the next class, that's a whole five days out of the two weeks that are gone before you have a, um, a project group together. So I understand that students do not always enjoy working in groups for school projects, but this is essentially the reality of the rest of your life working as a software developer unless you're an extraordinarily successful solo startup or something like that. Um, the ability to work with others in a reasonable manner is factored into the grade for this course. So even though it sounds like bullshit, I get it, right? Not only am I evaluating you for your ability to game program, but for your ability to game program and time manage and work with other people, okay? So that is a skill, like time management and working with other people in a group trust me, are just as valuable, if not more so, than your actual programming ability, right? If you're like John Carmack, but nobody likes you and doesn't want to work with you, then have fun never working anywhere, right? You've got to be able to work with people, and you've got to be able to sort that out. So that is 
trust me, like a significant portion of the, the grade that I'm giving you is for your ability to work with other people. So it's not for nothing. It's me, like I'm rewarding you for going through that, that torture. I know it's not, it's not great sometimes, but also, um, uh, just give me a second for the question. This is an important paragraph as well. If there are any problems with your group members not there doing their fair share of work, you must see me immediately so that we can work out a solution while there is time to do so. My truthful, honest, sincere observation over the years is that 99% of the time this happens, it is due to simple miscommunication between group members and can be solved with a few emails, right? Any time anyone has been like, oh, this person didn't do their thing, or they said they do this, or they disappear. It is either a really simple miscommunication where people did not effectively communicate what they expected of another person, or there was like a dire family emergency and someone just had to like leave the country because someone died, right? But if that's the case, we can obviously make exceptions for that. Um, but it is usually due to miscommunication. Nobody is out to get you. Right? No one is trying to sabotage their own group project. Maybe there's something going on that they may need a little bit of extra time or something like that, but trust me, it is just usually miscommunication. I have had people so upset at other group members, and they're like, they swear, they're like, oh yeah, they said they'd do all this, and they, you know, they didn't do this. And then one person was like, oh, I was on the Discord server, and no one was replying. They were just on the wrong Discord server or something like that. Like, it was, it's always something that's dumb. Right? No one is out to try and make your life miserable. If you wait until the final week before the project is due to come with me with group-related issues, there is probably nothing that I can do at that point. Everyone in this class is an adult, and part of the grade for this group is actually your ability to work well with others to accomplish a shared goal. Okay? So, please understand that I did as many or more group assignments as you. I know what it's like. I know when someone doesn't do enough work, but all of that is like literally one or two emails away from solving itself, okay? And I am happy to be a mediator if anything happens. Like, three people in the group say that one person has, hasn't like shown up to meetings in three weeks. Three weeks is too long to wait before you say something, right? If you are genuinely, sincerely making an effort to contact someone, and it's been a few days, that's the point at which you should come to me and say, hey, we're concerned this person hasn't replied in a few days. I can send them an email, right? And if they're not replying to me, then we got to talk about what's going on. But I've never had that happen where someone literally just dropped off the face of the earth. And just before I get into the, the entire description, despite the length and feature scope of the project, which can look pretty scary, most of it has actually been done already in the class assignments. You are allowed to copy any and all code from your assignments as a starting point for this course project. In this way, almost every line of code that you write for assignment 3 and 4 are being written for the project as well. Okay? The only exception that I'm going to take for this is that, let's say in the project description, it says, you can get bonus marks if you create a cool new weapon. That cool new weapon can't be the same bonus weapon from like assignment 2. Okay, so you can take all the code that you want, but none, not for the bonus stuff. So you had a question, yep. Yeah, so when you choose to design the project so that you do not mark them as based off of our ability to work with others, yep. are they dedicated marks for like being able to co collaborate, or is it just <coughs> the way the project is designed? So, so the question was, is there like a dedicated 10% or something yeah. devoted to how well you work with others? No. The reason is, I only know the people who can't work well with others. Everyone else I don't hear from, right? So I'm just going to assume that you got along perfectly with your group members unless I hear otherwise. So the way it's factored into the marking is by what you get done, right? And depending on what you get done, if there were issues with the group, like I had one group once that, you know, one person literally just did disappear. And they, um, I can't remember exactly what happened, nor would I repeat personal details, but those three people just had to like finish the project by themselves, right? And that ability to do that under a time constraint, etc., they got not all the features done, 
but their grade reflected the fact that one of the per the people left, right? So it's this like intangible thing that I can't create a marking scheme for. I'm not going to be like, oh, you had two meetings a week where you did seven lines of code each. Like, you know, I can't do anything like that. But it's it's just factored into the overall grade of did you work with them? You know, did I not hear any complaints, essentially? Okay. Um, project GitHub URL submission. I already uh, mentioned this part, so I don't have to read all that again. That's just saying to submit it. The marking scheme for the project. So the project marking scheme is broken down into a number of parts, and uh, you will get a broken down number for your final project. Um, there is, I will say that I've tried to create this marking scheme to be as, as fair and as reasonable as possible. But at the end of the day, when I look at the project and I play the game and I look at the code, there's like an intangible part of the mark where it's like, that game just feels really good to play, right? Or that game, I can tell how much work was put into that thing. Or I can tell that they cut a lot of corners and tried to pull a fast one on me and just submitted like assignment three for the project, right? So not everything can I break down percentage by percentage, but I will be sticking to this marking scheme and within that, there are some things that just over the course of years of teaching the course, it's sort of uh, an intuitive or subjective thing rather than strictly breaking the marks. It's like, for example, if there's 60% here for the gameplay and project code, I'm not just going to divide each feature into 60 and give a mark based on that, right? It's going to be usually better for you if I don't just strictly do that. So the project proposal is going to be 5% of the project. And the reason it's so much, despite being not that much work, is because it's very important to get that group up and running as soon as possible and get your game idea down on paper. Okay, so that's why that's worth 5%. It's not because it's 1 20th of the work of the project. It's because it's important to get that done by the deadline. The project demo, um, that will be 10%. So that's a sort of milestone to keep you on track. And as long as you're on track, that's basically like a free 10%, right? And if you did do a level editor for assignment three or assignment four, you've got most of that demo done already. Um, the project code and gameplay, that is going to be worth 60%. So that's the majority of the marks. And the project report video. So at the very end, you're going to have like a 20 minute video presentation where you record your gameplay Every single feature that you added to the game, you're going to have like, you're going to be able to show that off. And ideally, everyone in the group will sort of narrate based on what they did. Like, hey, I did all the menus. My name is Dave. Here's how the menus work. I'll walk you through it. My name is Joe. I did the, the, the rocket launcher. I'm going to talk about the rocket launcher, right? I understand that it's not always possible to get everyone narrating. You know, someone might have a, like a potato mic or something like that. I would rather the, uh, the audio be of good quality than everyone speak. So if someone is incapable of recording good audio, okay, just let their part be spoken by someone else. That's going to be worth 20%. Um, and the reason it's worth 20% is because essentially, if it's not in the project video, do not expect to get marks for it because I cannot play through every single part of every single game and test every single feature of every single game, right? So show me all the things. Here are our three weapons. Here's where we used the shaders. Here's where we did our bonus particle system or something like that, okay? Make sure that you show it in the video because if I don't see it there, there's a chance that I miss it in my playthrough. And please, please, I don't know why I have to keep saying, don't make your game the hardest game of all time. So many games I try and play and I just get instantly swarmed by 30 NPCs and it's like, no, just make it like baby difficulty but have cool features, right? I want to play the whole game. I want to actually see the final boss. I had, I've had demos where people spend two or three minutes dying in their own game, right? It's, it doesn't have to be hard. Like, it really doesn't. I'm, I'll show you a video of what I thought was like, like one of the projects that got 100% in the past. It's not 
a hard game. It's just a feature-rich game that looks pretty good. That's what I want. I don't want bullets going at infinite speed, or like, I've got to do this like crazy pixel-perfect jump. One person had this jump where like to beat the first le the first level, it was like so hard, and they were like, yeah, we made this so hard. I'm like, please don't make this hard. Like, I can play games, but like, I don't want like some Kaizo Mario impossible version of the game. Okay, so that's the, the report video. Make sure you play through the game, you show all the features. And the YouTube game trailer is going to be 5%. And I always get you to do both, because the YouTube game trailer is like an excellent thing to add to your resume or your portfolio, where it's like, hey, here's a cool game that we made. Employers will watch a two minute video. They're not gonna watch a 20 minute video, Maybe, maybe they will. If you're applying to a game company, maybe you can just link them to the project report and say what you've done. But that game trailer is like, it's a great thing to be able to show off what you've done. And so this, um, I used to have it in there as a bonus, but now it's just, no, you're going to get 5% to do something really easy and fun that you can use in your portfolio later. Question. Uh, so we have some 5%. Yep. Yeah. Let's say you think it's one of them, right? Would we adjust it later on to account for that? Yeah, so I'll give you feedback yeah. where I'm like, I don't think you should be making a massively multiplayer online RPG, right? Take away all the networking. Um, you probably should not be saying you're going to have like integrated chat and like chat GPT dialogue box. Like, you know, some people maybe want to do a lot more than they think they're capable of for this project. Or it's like, yeah, we're going to make Mario 1 and then no other details. Like, no, I, I need more than that. So you will get feedback on your project proposals. If you don't, it's because it's OK. But if it's not, it's because it's, it's not good on one end of the spectrum. Yeah. That's just to make sure that you're not like biting off more than you can chew or spending a bunch of time on something that you won't get 100% for if you do it all. I got to say this again. Important note, this is a game programming course. The final project is the most important part of the course being valued at 60% of the total grade of the course. Also, as the course syllabus states, you must pass the final project to pass the course. You cannot get 100% in all the assignments. Oh, geez and then obtain a 40% in the course, and then just submit a final project worth 10%. Okay? It's not how it functions. This is all about the final project. You must submit a project which has the vast majority of the required functionality completed. There is no other way to pass this course. Every year, one or two groups takes this warning lightly and puts off the project until the last minute. The result of doing this will be you failing the course. Please take this course as seriously as any other final exam you have in any other course. Here's an example from last year. Despite, I know that you're all adults, the people who come to class, I see you a lot, you absorb information, you're good students, but still, despite your eye rolling, last year I said all the exact same stuff, and one group just reskinned assignment three and passed that in. And it's like, sorry. Like, we had to work, like, three of those people needed this course to pass that, like, to graduate. And it was, like, it was, it was not fun for them having to, like, do twice the work over, like, Christmas break because they were, had, they were going to, like, their visa was going to expire or something. Don't put yourself in that situation. Take this course seriously, please, and take that final project seriously. Um, all right, that's the last time I'll mention it, but you, you have to do well in the final project. Um, I'm giving you as much time as I can to work on the project. It is due on the final day of exams in order to give me just enough time to mark it before I'm required to submit your grades. There will be no other extensions of the due date and no allowances for late submissions for the project unless there is some sort of serious medical emergency. And even if there is, we need to treat it as a formal request as a deferral through the university. So even if one person gets hit by a car, you know, we've still got to, because I won't have a grade for you. Because I've got to submit grades like three days later. And so we'd have to say, okay, this is like a deferred final exam or something, and it's a, it's a headache. 
So treat it as if it were a final, treat it, you know, as the only thing that really matters in this course. Okay. I won't, I won't state any of that stuff again, just be aware that it's very important. Required gameplay features and functionality. This section details all of the required functionality of the game. You can use it as a checklist to mark up your game's progress by putting an X inside the square brackets. What I mean by this is that you'll see a bunch of blank checkboxes, and if you edit the file, if you edit the markdown and put an X in it, it'll actually fill in that box with a check mark when you save it and commit it. So it's just a convenient way for you to be able to mark your progress. So the overview. The game must be implemented um, using an ECS architecture in C++ only using the SFML and IMGUI libraries. So no additional libraries. For the final project, you are not allowed to go out and use like Box2D or any of these physics libraries. I want you to implement everything on your own. You may use any code already written for assignments as the basis, that's what it base is, um, for your game project. Game type suggestions. So here are the main three types of games, because it has to be a 2D game. And it can't be like a board game because you won't be able to do all the features. Right? You can't just like make chess and hope that that's good enough for the final project. So I suggest either a platformer like Mega Man, Contra, Celeste, Shovel Knight, Mario, that type of game. There are top-down shooter games. Um, Hotline Miami, Enter the Gungeon, Brotato, Vampire Survivors. If you've ever played any of those, those are all great games that you can... Um, uh, that you can take inspiration from. Action RPG, so you can make like Diablo, Zelda, Binding of Isaac, Path of Exile, etc. So if you've ever played any of these games, and you like that game, and you want to make a game that is... You can literally... It, it doesn't have to be this super original idea. You can say, I'm going to make a, a clone as close as possible to enter the Gungeon as I can. Tons of weapons, tons of gameplay, you would have all the features in there. You can literally take a really cool game and just try and implement it, right? That's fine with me. It does not have to be a super original idea. The point is, here's some game mechanics. I want you to implement and program the game mechanics. It absolutely can be a completely new idea. I've had so many original ideas like, um, and we'll get to this in a bit in the features, but like one idea was like taking care of animals where the weapons were like throwing treats at dogs, right? Or like a net to, to stop one that was running away or something like that. Another one, you were um, trying to get through university. And so like you were in class and like when the exam started, like papers were flying at you and you had to hit them with pencils, right? Like it doesn't have to be a blood and guts, kill everything type of game. But, you know, it just has to have these features that, I, that I'm asking for. No assets or levels may be reused from the class assignments, and gameplay must be significantly different from the assignments. Meaning that you can't just have Mega Man running around and shooting a buster, right? Like, we've done that. You can't have the Mario 1 level that I included in, Super Mar in, in Assignment 3. I always get at least one project where level 1 of the project is like, 50% or more just taken from the levels that I gave you, either like assignment three or assignment four. It's really upsetting, right? And even if you do everything else 100% correctly, if you just take those levels and just like slightly change them, it's so, like, it's just like, why? Like, please just put a little bit of effort into that. It would be great. And most people do. So, just realize that if you just submit the things I've already given you, it's, it's not going to be a fun time. Just, just make sure you don't do that. So your game must contain at least three pre-built levels and a separate boss final battle level. Okay? So three pre-built levels and a boss final battle level. It must contain a custom menu that allows the, the player to play the game, edit levels, and select options must contain some sort of in-game menu, so item selection, inventory, whatever you come up with for that. Uh, it must contain a level editor, which allows for loading, editing, and saving of game levels. We'll talk about that a bit more at the end. Must contain a game over screen, in, uh, indicating when the game has been finished. 
All levels, player, and game configuration options must be defined in external text files. So if you have, like, weapons that have, I don't know, uh, a range or a speed of attack or a cooldown or something like that, trust me, you don't want to hard code all of those options. You want to have them in configuration files so that you can change them easily on your testing. When you're playing through, that's a little bit too hard. Let me change that. That's a little bit too easy. Let me change that. All assets should be gathered or created by project group members. So you do not have to make them on your own. Uh, I'm not expecting anyone here to be an artist or a Photoshop wizard. This is a computer science class, but please go out and find assets somehow. There are lots of assets out there. And it turns out that the games that end up looking the best are the ones that try and use the least realistic looking assets. Um, like if you go out and get like photorealistic pictures that like are animated, it just ends up looking weird when you're running on top of Mario bricks with that, right? So just try and keep, there, there's going to be like a small amount of the mark is going to be the overall aesthetic of the game and does it match, right? Now, if part of the game is the fact that it's weird and nothing matches, then you should put that in your proposal. Right? Like, if you have the whole game is themed around, like, animals and puppy dogs, and then the final boss is, like, some big vampire that, like, doesn't fit it whatsoever, just tell me why that is. If it makes sense, fine, but otherwise, it, it really does look like an afterthought, right? And part of the aesthetic of the game does, does matter. Um, so let me just give you a quick example of that. Um, on my website, I have this down here. This game was actually created for another course, but I think it's like a perfect trailer. So I'm going to show you what I think the perfect trailer for this class is. And it's so, it's like a simple game with a lot of functionality executed really well. So this was done several years ago, but I just, I really like the trailer. So let's just have a look at this, just two minutes. was called Egghead. They did have someone in the group who happened to be an artist who actually made the assets, but you don't have to do that. But I just want you to see how good it looks despite how simple it also looks. stop it there but you see like that looks like a game you might like to play right it's on theme all the assets kind of look similar it, you don't have to be that like perfect in the aesthetic or whatever but you can also see how there's something to the gameplay there are like switches these eggs do different things it's a unique idea it's simple to play but it's also interesting to play I don't want to be playing Dark Souls when I play your games. If you do do that, make the easy difficulty something that I can actually play, okay? So just, that's all it needs to be. It doesn't need to be super complicated um, in terms of aesthetics. All right, so here's the list of features. Um, for the next 20 minutes or so, we'll go through all of these. And again, it might seem like there's a lot, but you've already done a bunch of this stuff in, in your assignments by that time. So here are the scenes that I want to exist in the game. So a main menu scene implements the main menu and options functionality. Uh, an overworld map scene that allows the, for level selection or game progression. So if you ever played Super Mario Brothers 3, Super Mario World, Cuphead, any of these games where they're like, in order to do the level selection, you are actually walking around on a, on a map and say, oh, okay, I'm going into level one now. I'm going into level two now. That is the overworld game map that I, that I want you to have. The main gameplay scene that implements the main physics uh, of the game. Uh, some sort of inventory or in-game, this is supposed to be a menu scene that is used for a relevant function. A level editor scene 
that implements level editor functionality and a game over scene with some sort of animation and game over or credits. So I want different scenes and what you'll have to do for that is like take whatever um, scene that you already have as a template, copy and paste it, add a new file to the project and then you have a new scene. These are the required gameplay mechanics that I want to see in the game that have already been done in your assignments. So by the time you finish assignment four, you would have completed everything in this section. So all this stuff needs to be in the project, but should already be done, okay? So this is not like extra work, it's just stuff that should be done. So there should be collisions. I want uh, rectangular bounding box collisions between at least some entities. You are able to do other more complex collisions as you want for the bonus part, which I'll get to at the, ex at the end. Some collisions between the player and the level geometry, either walls, tiles, etc. Uh, movement. So your game must contain at least two movement abilities with a cooldown or a resource cost. So for example, a double jump. Um, so if you jump, you're allowed to jump once more before you land. Some sort of dash. So in that trailer I just gave, there was like a Mega Man dash on the ground where you press like down and a button and it just slides pretty fast along the bottom. Maybe a wall jump where you can kick off a wall or a jet pack with fuel. That's a pretty popular one I've seen in um, several games. So on top of the normal walking around abilities, I want some sort of movement ability. Um, I want there to be at least three unique weapons that are usable by the player. And before I, you know, okay, so for example, you could have a boomerang that gets uh, returned after it's thrown, a shotgun, a sword, a grenade, a shrink ray, etc. If you try and like, you know, if you have three guns, a Glock, a 9mm, and a Smith & Wesson, that is not three different weapons. When I say three different weapons, I mean different gameplay mechanics, right? So they should be uniquely different in some way. Um, one of the coolest weapons I saw was just a simple freeze gun where, okay, I can shoot. So let's say if I run into an enemy in a platformer, uh, I'm going to take damage from that enemy. Uh, this is actually kind of very similar to Super Metroid if you've ever played that game. So you run into an enemy, you just take damage. But if you freeze them, they stay in place, they're frozen in place as like a cube of ice for some amount of time, and now you can use that enemy as a platform to jump off. Okay, so just examples of weapons that you can have. But keep in mind that they must be different, not just reskinned, three different guns, three different bows and arrows, etc. <clears throat> Another cool one that I saw was uh, a bow and arrow where you could, you know, you had limited ammunition, but you could go walk and pick up the arrows that you had fired wherever they landed, something like that. Weapons must be swappable during gameplay via either a hotkey or a UI element. Um, at least one weapon must consume ammo obtainable during gameplay. Um, note that weapons do not have to be standard killing type of weapons. They could shoot treats to animal or have a bomb that makes everyone dance when it explodes. As long as they are three separate unique ways of interacting with the environment and NPCs. So I still call them weapons because that's just the easiest way of describing it. But any way of interacting um, sort of like, okay, I have this thing, I'm able to swap them and interact with the environment. NPCs. At least three unique non-player characters that act as enemies or allies. Must contain basic AI such as pathfinding, shooting, patrolling, or battling with the player. We'll do that in assignment four. Each NPC has a unique weapon or method for interacting with the player. So again, you can't just have three different reskinned birds and say that they're three different NPCs. They must have unique behavior in the game. Uh, hit points and damage. The player should have some sort of hit points and take damage and die. Again, any other analogy for that is fine. Like if you have a, you know, a university type of game, like I said before, where, oh, if you don't get a problem right or something, you know, you lose a grade, and if your grade goes to F, you have to restart. Like, whatever the mechanic is that mimics hit points is fine. Uh, invincibility frames must be implemented for all entities that take damage. Uh, we'll talk about that in assignment four. Enemy HP levels must be displayed to the user in some way. Again, assignment four. At least three different items should be obtainable uh, during gameplay via interaction. The UI should display an inventory of those items and allow for their use after obtaining them. So for example, 
um, a health pack. So in like an old game like Doom, you might just walk over a health pack, it would immediately restore some health. But these items, you have to pick them up, they go into an inventory, and then you use them at a later date. Okay? However you want to implement that is fine. But you pick up a health pack, let's say, then I take some damage, I hit the H key, or I, I menu to it, and I hit it, and then it restores some health. Maybe you have a sprint potion that makes you run twice as fast. Maybe you have a teleport scroll that makes you teleport to another location, whatever you want to do. Uh, you must have, do ray casting for visibility. This is something that we're going to implement for assignment four. So for example, a turret would fire at the player when it uh, enters line of sight, or an NPC aggros the player, starts attacking them after you round the corner and then they can see you. Um, there must be some sort of gravity or attractor in the game that applies acceleration to the player. So um, in assignment three, it's very obvious, or any, in a platformer, it's obvious what gravity is. It just pulls you back down. But if you have a top-down game, um, like one of these, like Hotline Miami or something, then instead of gravity, what I would like to have is some sort of attractor. So maybe some like black hole gun that sucks things in or something like that. Something that accelerates things towards something. Your game must use at least two different camera views in interesting ways. So you could have a standard view and then maybe a mini-map of a local area in the game, right? So we'll talk about views and stuff when we get to assignment four. Um, audio, you must have some sort of background music during gameplay and you must have sound effects that occur for all your unique things. So whenever you attack or you pick up an item, etc. It doesn't need to be a different sound for every item, but just some sound to indicate that things are happening. Um, assets, you can't use any assets that were given out in the course. Um, you do not have to create assets from scratch, but you can obtain them online. If you obtain them online, just please, um, in your final um, submission, maybe on the main page to say, hey, we got the assets from here on the bottom, just to give credit um, where it's due. These are the required gameplay mechanics that we will not be implementing in the assignments. So all of the previously listed uh, mechanics were implemented in assignments, so you should just be able to reuse that code for the project. Now, of course, it's not a complete reuse, because, for example, in assignment three and assignment four, you only had one weapon, right? So you would have to like create a new weapon, but that's such a, like a minor amount of code. That's, that's not an issue. But because this part, these required game mechanics are the new ones for the project, this is actually where the vast majority of marks will be given for the project. So what I do when I mark the projects is I'm watching your video before I play it. I watch the video and I open up this checklist of newly implemented things for the project and I go down and I check them, right? And if you only have half of them implemented, you're basically going to get half the marks, right? Now, I know it's not like a one-to-one -one thing. It depends on other factors, etc. But if you think about these mechanics as just like a linear weighting for your project, that's not a bad way to think about it. Like, if you implement none of these new things, you're not going to get any marks for the project, right? You can't just submit, like, assignment three and make a video. Oh, the video is 20%. No, you gotta, you gotta implement these things. So those things are an options menu. So whoever's in charge of the menu has a little bit of work to do. It's not that hard though. So an options menu that allows you to change the following setting, music volume, sound effects, game difficulty. So in game difficulty, you're gonna have easy, normal, and hard. One of the ways to implement that is just to have a scaling factor on how much damage you deal and how much damage you take, right? So you could have something like that. You could also have difficulty implemented in another way, it's just this is sort of the easiest way to do it. Um, the ability to rebind or remap um, the controls for your main gameplay. So up, down, left, and right, I should be able to um, click it and reassign it to whatever I want, so make sure you do that. Game progression. So the overworld map should somehow lock or unlock game prog uh, progression uh, based on levels completed. So I shouldn't be able to do assign or level two until I've done level one. I shouldn't be able to do level three until I've done level two. Just implement some way of doing that in your game engine. You must have the ability to save and load your game progress somehow to a file. So save a game, start a new game, just like any other game you've ever played. 
Status effects must contain at least three separate status effects. Status effects are obtainable in some way, either an item, a collision, an ability, etc. So for example, speed potion, quad damage, invincibility star, something like that. Now you can sort of double dip here with the items that you put in an inventory, right? So if you pick up a speed potion, that is a thing that's in your inventory, and then when you use it, you have implemented one of your status effects. Okay, so just keep in mind that um, you don't have to have three completely separate items from the three status effects. That's, those can be um, combined. User interface or heads-up display. Um, it must display player ammo, weapons and health, game progression, status effects, and timers, um, and other UI elements that you may have. But just keep in mind, when it, when it comes to this, this particular, like the player health, etc., I do not want to see just a default I am GUI like terrible looking UI with your player health listed or your ammo listed. I want for these things, which is like the heads up display, to have some little graphic, like maybe an SFML sprite that you drop. So yes, you can have a UI, the level editor, the game menus go crazy with I am GUI. But for the gameplay, I certainly don't want to have to be interacting with this like debugging slash I am GUI type of, type of thing. So if you load up any other game and it's displaying your health in the bottom left or your progress in the top right or you know, you're playing first person shooter and you've got your ammo on the bottom or the weapon selected, I would like that to be like a custom UI element that you're drawing to the screen and not just like the plain old blue and black uh, I am GUI stuff. Um, Moving tiles, so I do want to have some sort of the game have moving tiles that interact with the player. So for example, maybe you've got a river that you're trying to cross and you've got a thing that goes back and forth, you can jump on it and it's moving with you. Or you've got an elevator going up and down, something like that, I do want at least one moving tile. Shaders, we haven't talked about shaders yet. Um, shaders are essentially um, code that runs on the GPU to modify or draw something in parallel. It's not as hard as it sounds. It's Trust me, it's actually pretty easy. I want three different shaders that modify um, the graphics in the gameplay somehow. So for example, uh, the entity turns blue or it turns into a grayscale version of itself when it's frozen. Um, maybe if you're, uh, if you have some radiation or something, then it has like a glowing effect. Um, maybe if you get a star in the game, it's uh, alternating the colors of you. But just keep in mind that for the shaders, each shader must have some unique thing that it does. You can't just have, okay, uh, Mario turned red when he's in lava, Mario turned blue when he's on ice, and Mario turned green when he's in slime. No, that's not three different shaders. That's three different colors being applied by the same shader. So keep in mind, there are so many different things you can do with shaders. There are shader packs out there, both paid and free. You can write your own. I'll, I have a whole lecture devoted to that, so just keep in mind that you have to have at least three of those. Parallax, which we haven't talked about yet, but Parallax is essentially, in 2D games, um, it's the using of multiple different layers of things moving at different speeds to sort of give off a concept of depth where there is, is no actual depth. I have a whole lecture on games, uh, views, and cameras where we talk about Parallax. You've got to have some way, uh, some parallax implemented some way. Um, I want ray casting used for some simple lighting effect. I have a whole lecture on, on that ray casting stuff. So for example, maybe a torch illuminates around the player, or you have a flashlight sends a beam of light that kills a ghost or something like that. Um, some sort of simple lighting effect. Pathfinding or steering. Some entities in the game must exhibit non-trivial pathfinding or smooth steering behavior. So this is an or. You can either put in some cool pathfinding or put in some smooth steering behavior. And by smooth steering, we have, again, there'll be a lecture on this, but it's sort of the idea of, um, like, picture a homing missile that's following me, and as I'm moving, it's steering toward me. Okay, so you got to implement one of those two things. Um, and also, I'm leaving one thing up to you, one or more things, for 10% of the grade of the project. And so that's 10% of that 
10% of the Merc as a project is reserved for at least one major extra or new mechanic that is not specifically listed above. So here are some examples. A really complicated lighting effect that I think was enough work to do. Uh, a currency system that allows you to buy from an in-game shop, right? So it's not just, okay, I picked up a coin in the level and I hit a button and I get an ammo. It's like there has to be a shop that you go to in the overworld map. Like it has to be a major type of feature that's the theme of your game. Some sort of really fancy NPC AI that really goes above and beyond. Uh, you could implement a particle system for some cool special effects. I have a whole lecture on implementing a particle system. Um, you could implement dialogue systems into your game. So if you have some sort of RPG, you could walk up to someone, talk to them. It shows some text. You hit a button, it goes to the next text. You could say yes or no, whatever. Um, some sort of interactive dialogue system. Um, some sort of experience or leveling up system. This may want to be one of the easier ones. Every enemy that you kill gives you 10% of a level, whatever. You get more hit points, you get more strength, whatever, as you level up. But it's got to have, it's got to be well thought out and documented. It can't just be like, you know, every third enemy, I get 10% more hit points. It's got to be actually well thought out. So this is going to be this extra thing. There's a bunch of required things. And then this is sort of what your game is about, right? This extra thing that you're putting into your game. So this should be mentioned, the game's extra, maybe I called it bonus, it's not necessarily a bonus, but the game's extra functionality, that should be described in the project proposal. And just keep in mind though, it could change, but the proposal is about you getting together as a group, creating the GitHub repo and getting started. So it could change, but make sure you put something in there. All right, next is the level editor. Uh, you must contain a level editor similar to the one found in Mega Man Maker or Super Mario Maker. I'll show examples of that when I get to the game tools lecture. All of your game, uh, your main gameplay levels must be able to be made from within the level editor. So what this means is you're going to have three main gameplay levels. Those have to be created 100% from inside your level editor. If you have, for example, a really complicated final boss fight, I understand the need to, to code up part of that and hard code it rather than just using the level editor. So the main boss battle and the overworld map, they can be as hard coded as you want, but your three levels must be made in the level editor. And in your presentation video, I want you to actually go through the process of making a level. So spend two or three minutes making an actual level, saving it, and then showing me that everything works. I certainly don't have time to, to make levels with everyone's level editor. Uh, the level editor should operate on a grid, similar to the ones uh, found in assignment three and four. And the level editor must be made mostly with the IM GUI library. And it's actually much easier to make it with the IM GUI library than to make it without the IM GUI library. So you've already seen how you can list all the assets because I have that in there. Now just imagine all those buttons being, okay, when I click it, I add a new entity. Now, when I click in my level, I can actually just move the, the entity around and place it, and then I hit save, and it just, just spits everything out to a file. So the level editor functionality must have a menu that allows you to select an existing level to edit. So if you've saved it to a file, I've got to be able to load that file somehow. The ability to select and place any texture or animation that's defined in the assets. Um, any parameters of specific entities must be editable via the level editor. For example, whether the NPCs block vision or movement, I'll talk about that when I get to assignment four. Um, the hit points or damage, they should be editable uh, via the level editor. The control points or moving tiles. So, okay, I, I wanna put a moving tile in, I've gotta be able to set its start point and its end point within the level editor. So all of that stuff. Uh, I think finally, the, the project report video, the project must, became, must contain a video report or presentation, 15 to 20 minutes containing the following information, an overview of the game giving all the details described above, a description of all the extra features put into the game, um, demonstrations of all the game mechanics with at least one full level playthrough, also demo, demo the level editor, detailed list of controls for the game and instructions on how to play because I'm gonna be watching that video before I play your game, um, notes on anything you tried to implement that did not end up working. 
and the video must contain audio commentary or explanation and be uploaded to YouTube. That can be an unlisted video if you want, it can be a public video if you want, I don't mind whatsoever, but someone must be speaking in the video. And again, this is actually like secretly for your benefit. The, the, the ability to audibly talk about something you have created is and, and to talk yourself up and to say how cool your project is, is a skill that you should learn because you're going to be doing interviews and stuff soon. You should not be afraid to speak. I know, I know more than almost anyone in the world how awkward it is to hear yourself speak at first. Like, no one likes the sound of their own voice. It took me years after I, like the pandemic where I started creating YouTube videos for my videos, I was cringing so hard at the sound of my own voice. But trust me, you get over it. So don't worry. If you think it sounds bad, nobody is going to listen, it, listen to it but me or whoever else you want to listen to it. I'm not going to be posting those videos publicly. And um, post the video uh, URL to the main readme of this project. So really quickly again, once you get the demo done, once you get the trailer done, once you get the, um, the project pre presentation done, just come in here and edit them and uh, replace YouTube URL with whatever that is. If for some crazy reason, you cannot upload to YouTube, um, or like you have some moral anti-Google stance that doesn't let you make a Google account, try and post it somewhere online that you can put a link in, and if you absolutely can't for some crazy reason, then I will let you send me the video file, but probably not. I think YouTube is just gonna be the easier thing and it'll let you share it with other people in the future as well. Okay, any questions at all? about anything that I said, anything that wasn't clear. Yes? The project video length. 15 to 20 minutes. Yeah, that was, uh, that should have just been there. Yep. Uh, here we just like a sentence that takes five to drive the logo, or are they just too hard to do? Sorry, say that again? Uh, would there be like take five to describe the logo, like a normal size, like the, the, the interior from the text file and go with the logo? Yeah, so um, the question was about the level editor. The level editor must be able to edit a level and then save that level to a file. And s similarly, be able to load that level from the file, edit it, and then save the changes back to that file. So whatever syntax or format or specification that you come up with for your level files is 100% fine for me. However, the only stipulation is just make it like ASCII characters that it can actually be read by a human. That's, that's for your own benefit. Don't output like raw binary data to the file. It'll be a nightmare. But if you don't want to use the exact specification that I had for assignment three or assignment four, that is absolutely fine. And, I, and in fact, you shouldn't because your levels with that level editor should actually have more details than my levels. So. Yeah, they, they, they do need to read from a file. 